Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Berkeley Center for New Media's Arts, Technology, and Culture Colloquium. Uh, my name is Sophia Hussein, and I'm the events coordinator at the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. Uh, tonight's event is presented in partnership with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, uh, with co-sponsorship from American Cultures, the Arts Research Center, and the American Indian Graduate Program. I'm also super excited to share that um, BAMPA will be hosting a screening of films by the New Red Order tomorrow, um, and you can still get tickets if you'd like to go to that. And Adam Khalil, uh, one of the artists tonight, will be appearing in person. Um, I'll start us off by sharing a little bit about BCNM. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. Through critical thinking and making, we cultivate technological fairness and equity in our classroom, in our communities, and on the internet. Tonight's program is part of um, our ongoing arts, technology, and culture colloquium, which started in 1997. And it's also um, a new juncture for us um, in thinking about indigenous technologies, which is an initiative we started, I think, two years ago now. Um, our Indigenous Technologies Initiative explores questions of technology and new media in relation to global structures of indigeneity, settler colonialism, and genocide in the 21st century. Um, the thinking behind this series would not be possible without the theorists and artists who have enlivened our series, um, like the Khalils who are joining us tonight. Um, I also want to thank our Indigenous Tech coordinators, Marcelo Garza Montalvo and Sierra Ed. Um, and my collaborators at BCNM, Gail DeKosnick, Laura Wolf, and Clancy Wilmot. Um, so as part of our initiative, uh, BCNM commits to supporting indigenous sovereignty. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the confederated villages of Lishan. The history of prolific technological development in this region, as in every region, has always depended on the land and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place here today on and in relation to this land. At BCNM, we commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. Um, as a member of UC Berkeley and BCNM and a Berkeley resident myself, I acknowledge this legacy as well as the fact that this land cannot be understood without the recognition of several centuries of colonial violence exerted against its native peoples. Um, tonight's event also leads us to consider the Hearst Museum on the UC Berkeley campus, um, which makes the connections between Western expansion, scientific racism, and indigen indigenous genocide abundantly clear. BCNM supports the work of the NAGPRA committee to facilitate the rightful return of indigenous remains and call and we call our honor audience members to support their work and join us in learning about this history. Um, in the chat, we'll share a timeline that was created by Pilar Jefferson, a grad student um, that chronicles the history of the Hearst Museum and UC Berkeley's relationship with native communities in California. I want to thank um, our Indigenous Tech Coordinator again, Sierra Ed, Pilar, um, and the many members of the Indigenous community on campus who have put a lot of effort into consolidating information about NAGPRA and making that more accessible. Um, I also want to invite everyone to participate tonight by responding in the chat. Um, you can feel free to leave a question in the Q&A box and we'll return to it after the presentation. Um, I also just want to emphasize that um, we want our attendees to help us maintain an inclusive and harassment-free space. Um, attendees who violate any of these guidelines will be removed. Um, and we do have a list of community agreements if you're new to our events. Um, I also wanna mention that we have captions if you'd like to turn them on. And thank you to Teresa Clemens who is live captioning our event tonight. Um, and with that, I'm so excited to introduce Zach and Adam Khalil. Um, Zach and Adam Khalil are members of the Ojibwe tribe. They're filmmakers and artists from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Adam Khalil's practice attempts to subvert traditional forms of ethnography through humor, relation, and tra transgression. Khalil is a co-founder of the Cousins Collective of Indigenous Filmmakers. Zach Khalil's work centers on indigenous narratives in the present and looks towards the future through the use of innovative nonfiction forms. 
Adam, Zach, along with Jackson Paulus, and a changing group of collaborators also make up the New Red Order, a public secret society that creates videos, performances, and exhibitions related to indigeneity. Um, I first learned about the Kills work through the first film, And Not to Say, which came out in 2016. The film is a documentary of the indigenous community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, and it's also an experimental film, very much alive in its reimagining of the Anishinaabe Seven Fires prophecy, which predicted the loss of an indigenous culture with the arrival of European colonizers. Since 2016, the Khalils have enlisted more collaborators. Their work has expanded into a network of pseudo-public and secret societies, shifting from film to performance using stunts, proxies, and reappropriating nationalistic iconography and the language of civic responsibility for subversive ends. They are artists constantly in motion, slipping away in opacity with every advance of settler colonial institutions like this one that attempt to understand them and seek liberal catharsis. As individuals and part of the New Red Order, their films and installations have ex been exhibited at Artist Space, the Museum of Modern Art, Lincoln Center, the Whitney Museum, the Walker Art Center, the Sundance Film, film Festival, and many others. Um, let's take a moment to welcome both of the Khalils and thank them for their participation in our Indigenous Tech program tonight. Thanks for having us. I'm, I'm blushing at that intro. Ooh. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, Ani Bojo, Shingwa Kandijna Kaz, Bawating and Donjaba. Uh, my name's Adam Khalil, filmmaker and artist from what's currently called Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Uh, but I've been living out in Brooklyn for the past decade and now kind of Copenhagen, but zooming from the Bay. It'll all make sense soon. And yeah, I'll turn it over uh, to my dear friend and brother, Zach. Thanks, Adam. Uh, my name is Kwame Benini, Indigenous Kaz, Abouting and Dunjaba. My name is Zach Khalil. I'm also a filmmaker and artist from Bawateng, and it's currently called Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, uh, also based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and yeah, collaborator and uh, brother of Adam. I'm super excited to be here and speak to you all about uh, a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah, and maybe to kind of lay out kind of the scope or trajectory of how this time will go, and also uh, thanks so much for having us and also the invitation to kind of unpack this like the running joke is a new red order is pretty high tech for a native group uh -huh. uh, but I think we're constantly trying to push back against the stereotype of indigeneity or authenticity in terms of indigeneity existing in the past uh, but not stopping at just kind of invoking our present presence but also imagining promoting and realizing indigenous futures and that's why this whole series of talks has been really inspiring and the other people who've participated, it's really humbling to be lumped in with that crew and that group. Uh, yeah. Should I keep going for a sec, Zach? Yeah, yeah Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I guess a little confusing because we collaborate so frequently with so many different people. So I also just want to acknowledge all of our collaborators who aren't part of this conversation. Uh, maybe it's dangerous to list them out because I might forget someone, but just a shout out, um, but also prefacing that because I feel like all of these collaborations tend to bleed into each other and they all kind of operate around similar kind of philosophical or discursive concerns uh, and that they kind of slip porously between back and forth and inform each other. So we'll kind of like talk about our personal trajectory as Adam and Zach or Zach and Adam uh, in terms of our practice and the projects that we're working on and also excited to share a sneak peek of an in-progress feature doc that we've been working on for four or five years, maybe a lifetime. It'll all make sense soon. But uh, before we get into nitty gritty, I just wanted to kind of put out kind of conceptual framework where I feel like New Red Order and our personal practice is constantly oscillating between this kind of two contradictory forms of thinking. One is this kind of like dialectical, material, historical, like real politics uh, and that manifests in claims for repatriation and rematriation of ancestors and control of indigenous knowledge from it by indigenous people uh, and that can kind of be like foregrounded or put into a frame thinking through Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor where it's calling for the uh, the return of all indigenous land and life and that's what decolonization means to them and that's something that we really 
take to heart. Um, but because that's such a lofty goal, uh, there's also this other form of kind of thinking that we're very invested in, which could be considered magical thinking. Uh, and a lot of it comes from Christopher Bracken, who's a philosopher based at University of Alberta, who wrote this great book called Magical Thinking, or no, Magical Criticism, oops, busted. Uh, but he kind of coined this idea of savage philosophy, which we'll be presenting on in the second half. So we'll kind of go oscillate between more material practical concerns and then maybe more esoteric, potentially dangerous concerns that could elicit crimes against reality. And in the ways in which they, they loop around and sort of influence each other, I think is, is really important too. Or savage philosophy quickly encapsulated now is just this idea that sort of, you know, uh, things don't just, when they represent things, things don't stand in place for things. They actually sort of take part in reality. Representation makes reality. Discourse deploys forces. Um, so it's thinking more around the power of representation as opposed to material concerns. But when we get around to the end, I think we'll see how they're quite intertwined as well. It'll all make sense soon. Uh, also, if people have questions or if something's unclear or if there's clarification that needs to happen, feel free to throw it in the chat. We're going to multitask through this, uh, but it's always good when there's like a dialogue and we're we're here to talk to you all. So let us know. Should we start off chronologically? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Yeah, I'm happy to get started if you want. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks so much for that. And yeah, thanks so much for the amazing intro too. Um, I think it is, it's interesting to think as a starting point about our, our first film and not to say, uh, which was sort of mentioned is, uh, I think one thing that's important about that film that really frames uh, our sort of emphasis on technology and, and the rest of our, our practice is this sort of uh, comparing between a sort of indigenous or specifically Anishinaabe um, sort of means of of making history and the technology used to, to document and record and perpetuate history um, into the future and comparing that with a sort of settler colonial version of history. Um, that also gets to like a more personal place with us um, where the film in many ways is a collaboration with our, our late mother, uh, Alison Bouchard Krebs, um, who was uh, a library scientist, uh, in indigenous information scientist, um, who was really focused on getting her PhD and thinking about how um, sort of the, the power of indigenous knowledge should be controlled by indigenous people and by indigenous institutions. Um, and that was sort of the starting point for, for that film and for our practice um, in general, sort of comparing and contrasting these sort of settler colonial versions of history that seem really focused on sort of encapsulating the past into tidy archives so that it can be sort of safely manipulated or forgotten about, um, comparing and contrasting that with the sort of our Anishinaabe version of history, our technologies, whether it's birch bark scrolls or storytelling or high eight cameras, uh, different ways of documenting the language um, and how that sort of way of thinking about uh, history is really uh, about thinking about how to perpetuate culture into the future as opposed to sort of preserving the past, which is that sort of more anthropological emphasis. Um, I think also, you know, just the fact that we're filmmakers and working in the, in the media of film is really important as Indigenous people. Um, just thinking about the sort of uh, really difficult relationship between Indigenous people and the moving image sort of since its inception. Um, going all the way back to thinking about like Thomas Edison and some of the first uh, recorded images were of, uh, you know, Sioux Indians dancing in the, the Wild Bill Wild Bill's Wild Bless show. Um, Kind of like one of the first documentaries is you know, for the North, um, which is sort of like an early piece of branded content for a French fur company and was sort of sold as, as being super authentic. It's really a, a patronizing and misleading depiction of, of indigenous life. Um, so there's just like all these early examples of, of thinking about how uh, the form of film is sort of inherently settler colonial and was developed in settler colonial contexts to meet settler colonial ends. So when thinking about making a film about our own tribe uh, and using our own tribe stories and fire's prophecy, we wanted to think really critically about cinematic form itself um, and, and how that, if we don't sort of question cinematic conventions, we're sort of automatically playing into uh, a settler colonial worldview of sorts. Um, 
And yeah, do you have anything else you want to add about not to say before we maybe play it? Maybe we'll just play the teaser and then we can kind of take it from there. That sounds great. So we'll just play a 60 second trailer just to give a, a taste of the film. But uh, it's loosely based on the Seven Flowers Prophecy, which is a oral, oral story, oral tradition from our community that predates and predicts first contact with Europeans. And maybe I'll shut up and play the thing and then we can keep it moving. Cool. Two and a half seconds. Oh, almost there. Oh, oh, almost there. Come back. Track. I'm going to get smoother with the mechanics pretty soon. Okay. It is from understanding that power comes. And the power in the ceremony was in understanding what it meant. And while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. I did not have to remember these things. They remembered themselves all these years. So we kind of wanted to start off chronologically because like in a weird way that will help in terms of the trajectory of this. But in this film, there was also like a deep investigation in terms of uh, we were able to actually like with our mother before she passed away, go into the cold storage facilities in Suitland, Maryland for the National Museum of American Indian Smithsonian Collection, which is an interesting and compl complicated place. Uh, my running joke is that it would be like the National Israeli Museum for Palestinians. Uh, it's complicated from the get-go, but it's also made a lot of changes in the past 10, 15 years to kind of reprioritize Indigenous knowledge for Indigenous people. Uh, and that's been heartening, especially considering the, the complicated legacy surrounding uh, Indigenous cultures and science and how they relate in terms of archives and institutions. Um, but I guess maybe on a more personal note that conversations around repatriation or rematriation, whether they be ancestors, a la human remains or cultural objects, is something that we were kind of raised around and something our mother was really passionate about. And there were other people in our community like Cecil Pavlot uh, and then Colleen St. Ange, who's now kind of been mentored by Cecil, who's kind of continuing that work. Uh, and that Michigan tribes specifically have been really robust in terms of interfacing with institutions to expedite this process and pushing things kind of intertribally um, in order to return ancestors and cultural objects. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, it's in, in not to say really like, um, you know, focuses on, on the archive, um, but, you know, as, a, as one aspect of sort of telling this larger story, the Seven Fires Prophecy, a sort of macro view of, of the history of, of where we're from. Um, but it also, it is really fundamentally about, about the archive and those practices as well. But don't, we didn't necessarily have the opportunity to do like a deep dive into that subject, um, which is maybe a good time to pivot to thinking about our next projects, um, the violence of the civilization without secrets. Maybe I could just add something yeah. That could be a good distinction just to, to bring up for later in the conversation as well. That also is something I think we're really thinking through is this idea that information is something that should be accessible for all, but knowledge has a different kind of patina or quality to it. And this oscillates between like ideas of anthropology and ethnography, and then also like salvage ethnography in terms of why anthropological museums uh, consume and keep so much of our cultures. Um, and just also, a lot of this can slip into these kind of dialectics where it's like science bad, indigeneity good. And I think actually what we're trying to do is complicate those notions. And that's something that's also been really exciting to see play out 
in the past couple of years where there's an emphasis on collaboration and that there's a kind of meeting in the middle of these different kind of philosophical concerns uh, and a realization that indigenous epistemologies and philosophies are actually necessary to create a future that we'd all want to live in. Um, and I guess maybe the one other thing just to tack onto that because we're kind of conflating history, the construction of history, and also uh, in relation to these different kind of archival practices. Mm -hmm. But that one of the things that attracted to us, attracted us to the Seven Fires Prophecy is that it's a totally kind of embodied Ojibwe philosophy of telling history in the sense that the Seven Fires are these kind of like touching points throughout history, but they're not monolithic. They're not written in stone. They're meant to change. And this idea that history should be a narrative in service of the present so like in a couple of generations, uh, the seven fires will be different than what they are now. And that's the way it's been told since time in memoriam. Uh, when you contrast that with something like Walter Benjamin's concept of history is the angel of history always moving forward, but looking backwards at the destruction, uh, it's kind of was exhilarating to think about history as a malleable format, as a narrative format, as something that can be kind of channeled and retooled which is something that happens anyways all the time in terms of ideology and perspective. Uh, because yeah, and that kind of goes back to our critique of a lot of documentary and nonfiction filmmaking, this idea that objectivity is kind of a fallacy and that documentary or ethnography has a proximity to, it feels objective, but we all know what's not in the, what's outside of the frame isn't really considered a lot of the time. Yeah, I think that de-emphasis on objectivity is, is certainly uh, a big part of our practice and I think it's part of, uh, of a lot of indigenous sort of worldviews and epistemologies and ways of, of thinking as well. Um, and the inclusion of multiple conflicting subjective perspectives to sort of create a, a more accurate whole uh, in a way. Um, and uh, yeah, I really, yeah, that, that distinction between information and knowledge I think is, is incredibly crucial uh, to thinking through sort of repatriation and sort of how to uh, decolonize institutions as well uh, in really material ways. So maybe going forward on this decolonization is not a metaphor track in terms of the material historical uh, political relevance of some of the concerns and issues we're bringing up. Maybe we'll play a short film from 2017 or 18, I can't remember, uh, The Violence of a Civilization Without Secrets, which deals specifically with repatriation, repatriation of ancestors. And that'll kind of set up the project we're currently working on. The sound good, Yuzak? That's great. Cool, cool. This is a nine minute film, just a heads up. Almost there. There, I'm going to share the screen. One morning in 1784, Thomas Jefferson became America's first archaeologist when he decided to indulge his curiosity and unearth human remains from an Indian burial mound. Since that day, Archaeologists, anthropologists, amateur explorers, and hobbyists have collected and sent thousands of boxes of indigenous human remains to museums and universities, often in the hope that they would become the objects of scientific study and help prove widely held beliefs about indigenous racial inferiority, or to prove insight into an alternate history that the first people in the New World were in fact European. It was one of those things no one ever doubted. The first people on this continent were the Indians, period. No reason to believe otherwise. But two summers ago in the town of Kennewick, Washington, a skeleton turned up that could turn out to be the missing link between what we thought to be the truth and what actually is the truth. A truth, if it is the truth, that the Indians are not happy with and would just as soon leave well enough alone. The story of Kennewick Man started out like an ordinary murder mystery. 
two young men made news when they found a skull on the bank of the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington. Suspecting foul play, they called the police, who thought the skull looked very old. They were right. Anthropologists excavated the area and found the full skeleton and determined it had been carefully buried along the river 9,000 years ago. One of the oldest intact skeletons ever found in North America, a scientific treasure. Prosopopoeia, prosopia, prosopopoeia. Noun, a figure of speech in which an abstract thing is personified. Noun, a figure of speech in which an imagined or absent person or thing is represented as speaking. Human remains are the kind of things from which the trace of the subject cannot be fully removed. Their appearance and presentation in the courts of law and public opinion has in fact blurred something of the distinction between object and subject between evidence and testimony. You could put this one in a crowd of, of Native American skulls. I mean, you could put him in with a hundred of them and you'd still pick him right out of the crowd. His skull shape falls way outside the range for modern Native Americans. But I'm asking about the central question of concern. Who was here first? Doesn't he already challenge that? He challenges it. He challenges it. He does. Misplaced guilt is too heavy a rucksack to carry about. But our ancient roots on this continent give us position as good as or better than any, one that is not a settler mentality, that we are not newcomers, that we are not interlopers, that we are not evil conquering Europeans, but that in fact we have ancient, ancient roots here that give us a right to say we too are native peoples, we too are first peoples, we too are indigenous to this soil. We have our roots here, we will not surrender, we will not be swept from this place, but we will instead sink those roots deepen those roots, not be transient, but instead truly inhabit this place. Forensics is, of course, not simply about science, but also about physical objects as they become evidence. Things submitted for interpretation in an effort to persuade. Since objects do not speak for themselves, a person or a technology must mediate between the object and the forum to present it and tell its story. In U.S. court, the remains of the Kennewick man are considered objects. Each bone and other piece of property was contested ownership. And only forensic anthropologists have the authority to speak for them, to tell their story. But for the Columbia Basin tribes, the Ancient One is an ancestor. His bones were unearthed from Indian land, so they speak for themselves. We know what happened 10,000 years ago. I know what happened 10,000 years ago at home along the Columbia River because my teachings from my older people tell me how life was 10,000 years ago. 
And the scientists cannot accept the fact that just because it's not written down in a book, it's not fact. It's fact to me because I live it every day. as a trophy case to exhibit the settler colonial power's most prized possessions. Everything is turned into an object and a display, no matter what it is, no matter if it is a piece of the earth, an ivory tusk, the shell of a tortoise, or human remains. The entire museum's practice speaks of the terrible impulse of domination, a sort of indiscriminate domination nothing escapes the collector's impulse, as if our entire linear and accumulative culture collapses if we cannot stockpile the past into plain view. Memory is not a container for information, but a perpetually emergent process. Yeah. Thanks for checking that piece out. I think I don't know what one interesting thing we talk about is it's, I think it's how interesting how uh, that story of the ancient one or the Kenwick man um, really embodies uh, so many of the sort of underlying ideological debates uh, or undercurrents that are that exist when it comes to thinking about repatriation and, and ancestors specifically. Um, Especially when you think about sort of some of the archaeologists and sort of their their arguments um, for for wanting to study and for needing to study and this sort of underlying um, desire to claim some sort of indigeneity um, of their own, uh, I think is is really loaded and it really does underlie a lot of um, archaeological practice. Um, but I think also to your point earlier, Adam. Um, it's important to not set up this sort of dichotomy between uh, indigenous people and science because that's a super false dichotomy. It's right? also a slippery slope in terms of like post-truth and like, uh, yeah, there's like this complication about like an understanding that science and technology is for the common good, but then also like a reading of the undercommons in terms of like who's considered as a part of the commons and that indigenous people have been excluded from that commons. Uh, so therefore, if something's claimed to be for the common good, it can get complicated and pretty slippery pretty quickly. Uh, and I think that's something in terms of trying to articulate 
not a dialectic or oppositional approach, something that needs to be kind of understood and unpacked with nuance. But it's really complicated because also the history of science is super racialized, like from the research we've been doing, like the study of phrenology, like human skulls. It actually started with this crazy book called Crania Americana, which was actually developing all these like lithograph techniques where they were actually pressing human skulls onto print in order to create these kind of textured images. And it was almost exclusively of different tribes, ancestors, skulls. So it was like Cherokee, Ojibwe, Potawatomi. Um, and that's like from the 1800s. And again, like one of the foundings of a lot of this stuff, you know, relates back to eugenics and all kinds of other twisted, gnarly stopping points and diversions for science. Um, maybe just to make that explicit, like the Peabody Museum at Harvard in its original charter mission statement, like the number three thing it's set out to do is to collect the bones of native people for study uh, in terms of figuring out who was here first. And yeah, like as Zach was saying, that kind of obsession with answering that question uh, without looking at the embodied history and realities that people from here are saying is true leads to these really messy situations. Maybe one thing anecdotally, and I'll pass it back to you, Zach, but just we did a residency in Hawaii not too long ago, and there's this big situation right now where indigenous Hawaiians are trying to invoke their own tribal sovereignty or their own sovereignty, not tribal, sorry, uh, to prevent a uh, major telescope going on a sacred mountain on the big island. Uh, and something from those protests and that activism that really stuck with me is they had this chant that was pro-science and pro-sacred. And that really blew my mind in terms of thinking through this, not being an oppositional uh, relationship, but actually something that like with greater understanding discourse and dialogue could be mutually beneficial and reciprocal for both parties. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that that oppositional uh, sort of setup is, is a bit of a trap uh, too, in a way. Um, and I think, you know, I think that that oppositional nature was like really present in, in that piece of violence of civilization, that secrets. I think in a lot of ways, that's because we were sort of responding to that 60 minutes uh, piece, which originally came out. Um, which was just uh, so so one-sided and sort of sensational. And the sort of like thesis of it was like, hey, like us white people might be, us settlers like might be indigenous. Um, and sort of 60 Minutes is known for like following up on things, but <laughs> they never did with that story. Um, so it was, it, for us, I think it was important to sort of tell the other side of that, um, which sort of created this, uh, just did sort of go along with that oppositional setup. Um, but I think it's also hard to escape sort of approaching the subject that way when you go into the history that you're talking about, Adam, with this, this history of, of collecting our ancestors, you know, really starting um, first, like with, you know, Thomas Jefferson, like discovering mounds um, and, and early archaeology starting on people, people uncovering mounds and sort of thinking like, oh my God, this is a really advanced civilization. Like they can't be, early archaeology was all about proving that the mound civilizations weren't Native American people, that they were the lost tribe of Israel or they were Babylonians, um, sort of like, uh, sort of came from a colonial disbelief that Native people could have, I think, built such advanced structures in the first place. And once that became a sort of impossibility, once they realized there was just so much evidence that we clearly had built those structures, it sort of shifted to um, this sort of eugenics and chronology thinking, a sort of proving uh, these sort of early racial pseudoscientific theories, which of course were all um, incorrect. And when that went out of fashion, it sort of shifted to this justification of, like Adam was talking about, early population migration, um, which in some ways still gets back around to that first question of sort of undercutting indigeneity and, and having settlers be able to claim it in, in one way or another by sort of bringing up the who got here first argument. Um, so it's hard not to get into that oppositional mode when the relationship between scientists and indigenous people have been so fraught for so many years. Um, but like Adam was saying and emphasizing, pro-science and pro-sacred is possible. And science is not a bad thing if it's done ethically, you know, and with consent to, and cooperation, um, which is a really important thing to emphasize and something that we sort of get into deeper um, in, our, in our next project as well. 
Like one other thing, maybe just to point out, because like, I mean, I'm at Berkeley right now, like a couple hundred meters away from the Hearst Museum. And just like the story of Ishii, who was like a, a living person who was kept in a museum, uh, just in terms of like revealing the insane logic underneath all of this. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think that that's really important to, to reference. Um, in the fact that his his remains and his, his brain were sent to the Smithsonian against his, his will after he passed away. Um, it's a real, real tragic story and a big part of Berkeley's legacy when it comes to repatriation. Maybe set up Ani Kobage again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the violence was sort of our first forte into to really uh, making the project specifically about repatriation. Um, and it's a really, you know, tricky, tricky, difficult topic. It's so uh, often sensationalized um, and it's so sensitive. The ancestors themselves have been violated for so long. Um, in, in order to make content about it, to make media about it is really tricky. Um, but our, our next, at the same time, we sort of realized that, you know, even inside indigenous circles and outside of indigenous circles, there's so little awareness about these collections of ancestors sort of housed in, you know, these institutions that well-meaning liberal people hold in really high esteem, these universities and museums. Um, and, you know, there, of course, there are all these ongoing efforts to repatriate um, through NAGPRA, the federal law, but they all take a really long time and a lot of resources and more resources need to be dedicated to this process in order for it to, to work for indigenous people. Um, and sort of through that thinking um, and through, you know, work with people in our community who are actually sort of on the front lines of repatriation work, um, this association, MACPRE, uh, the Michigan Anishinaabe Cultural Preservation Repatriation Alliance. That's MACPRE, uh, not NAGPRE. The acronyms are <laughs> going to get nuts from here on out. Bear with us. <laughs> Definitely. Thank, thank you for that. Um, but MACPRE is essentially like a, a work of a collaboration of all the tribes in Michigan, state and federal, um, that work together to expedite repatriation processes. Um, and so our next film uh, is titled Lana uh, Kobachukun, um, which essentially means ancestor get into that a little bit more later. Um, but we wanted to focus on, on MACPRA specifically and the sort of uh, work on the ground that needs to happen to make repatriation possible. We'll also sort of be able to zoom out and take this bigger picture look, uh, three and four or 500 year look at the sort of, you know, the history of science and archeology span in relation to indigenous people in this, this practice of collecting remains um, as a way, you know, to, to actually I think, you know, often I, I think we question the, the utility of documentary sometimes to sort of uh, change, change hearts and minds, uh, and, uh, I guess. Um, but I think when it comes to repatriation, there is like an actual utility in making people aware that these institutions um, have ancestors and maybe aren't completely compliant with tribes. Um, so that's part of the, the impetus for the project for us is, is really just like uh, help expedite repatriation nationally and internationally. I think that part of that too is also to highlight and honor the people who are doing the actual work of repatriating and rematriating ancestors and having spent time with these people just kind of blown away by how intense that work is uh, in terms of the bureaucracy they're up against, the resources they have, the kind of spiritual fight that they're undergoing to bring back ancestors. And the belief that, that that work is trying to create a sense of healing within our communities to put things back where they need to be so that way we can all move forward. And that there's this kind of interesting irony about needing to return ancestors in order to an imagined futures that we'd want to exist in. And that kind of displacement of temporality is something really kind of profound and and moving, I think, for both Zach and I. Oh. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the yeah, the, it is really created to, to honor the actual on the ground work that people do. And then what that actually means in terms of um, that sort of cyclical nature of time that, that we were talking about earlier a little bit and that sort of reference the seven fires prophecy, um, how that's very much like a part of our, our lived reality and, and why the ancestors need to come home um, as well. I guess maybe to set up the, the 
thing a little bit. Just this is a Anikobijigan is a project Zach and I have been working on for five years in very close consultation and collaboration with MAGPRA. And again, the thing that's really special about MAGPRA with an M, Michigan Anishinaabe Cultural Repatriation Alliance, is that a lot of times uh, archives and collections will do this thing where like, like a practical example is like, there'll be ancestors at University of Michigan or Michigan State, and they'll say like, oh, we're pretty sure they're from your tribe, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, but they might be from the Bay Mills tribe, which is a tribe that's like 30 miles, maybe less away from us. And they would use that as justification not to return any of the ancestors because they didn't want litigation happening later on saying, oh, well, you gave the ancestors to the wrong tribe. So kind of tribes across Michigan collectively organized to, 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 to bargain basically at the table and be like, well, we don't really care because <laughs> we're all kind of like part of the same community anyways. Like our priority is just to get the ancestors back home. Um, and I guess, in terms of our practice, this is an interesting project because it's getting support from PBS and other kind of more traditional documentary funding sources. And our style is uh, pretty idiosyncratic normally or experimental, some might say. So it's been a, a learning curve, but a very good one. And I guess maybe the other thing is like, one of the big complications is like we have to make this film in a respectful way and that's why we've been working in such close consultation because if we do things that are disrespectful to our own communities what's the point of making this in the first place but the number one thing that like is the biggest no-no is showing remains showing ancestors uh so it's also this complicated thing where we're trying to make a film about a subject that we can never show nor would we ever want to um and that's been an interesting creative challenge in terms of figuring out how to articulate the stakes of the story without doing this thing that always happens where you're like, you're supposed to show it, not say it when you're making a film, you know what I mean? Um, and we're gonna have to get creative and funky with it. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great, great lead up. So maybe we can just play this sort of, it's like a 15 minute uh, sample of the ongoing. You gotta sell it better, sneak peek, never before seen. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, five years in the making. Hopefully, it'll be cooked as a feature doc in year. A year. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're busted because we used the same minute of violence to open this film. So I'm just gonna sneak past that. Scrub ahead. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. Okay. That's close enough. Yay. Zach, I might take it from the top because it has a different intro. Well, whatever. Yeah, go, go for it. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Sharing the screen. morning in 1784, racial inferiority. When I enter the museums, I'm not looking at what's on the walls. I'm wondering what's behind them. I wonder if people know that they paid $20 to enter a museum that's holding our ancestors hostage. That's the core question, who owns human remains? Legally, the institutions own them. Spiritually speaking, we know that nobody owns them. professionals are really uncomfortable with the ways that indigenous communities collapse time in relation to objects. There's an assumption on, in the Western mindset that distance in time through years means distant in relationship, and that's just simply not the case. It's like in Potawatomi, our word for ancestor or great-grandmother, great-grandchild is um, Ankopchigan, and so that means simultaneously ancestor and future generation. We 
emphasize this notion of relationship rather than our place on some made-up linear timeline. It's that tether of relevance that's important, not so much how long ago something happened or how long something will take to happen. Grandfather, give us the courage and the strength as we make these decisions for our people and for our ancestors that guide us through our days. So we thank you um, for the beautiful prayer. My name is Colleen Rose Medicine. My spirit name is Wapshka Sineque. I'm Turtle Clan. I currently serve as the cultural repatriation specialist for the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Repatriation is a really loaded word. Um, I often describe it as a lot of worldviews coming together. In Indian country, repatriation means returning our ancestors and their objects back to their communities for an appropriate and respectful reburial. I got a call about a month ago from the Algon County Historical Society. They had uh, discovered that they had um, ancestors in their possession. Just for my notes, do you know how many ancestors there are and if there's any objects? One ancestor, he said it's almost a complete ancestor. Ready, I'll pick it up Sydney? tonight on the way home. Yeah. <laughs> you ready, Sydney? Yes, I'm ready. His number is 269. MACFRA is the Michigan Anishinaabe Cultural Preservation and Repatriation Alliance. The original vision of MACFRA was that all the tribes in Michigan come together and do this important work to bring the ancestors home. At the University of Michigan, the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, approximately 801 minimum number of individuals have been repatriated to date. When my grandkids and that asked me about it, I explained, I'm bringing your grandpa and grandma's home and putting them back in Mother Earth. It's the most stifling, crumbling feeling when you go into the bowels of a museum where they keep boxes and boxes filled with our ancestors' remains. have the same structure for cemeteries as our contemporary Euro-American cemeteries do. They don't have clear defining markers for where they are buried. And there is no quantitative value that you can put on how many sites there are because it's everywhere. And you can feel the presence everywhere. And so for hundreds of years now, development has occurred in these areas and many ancestors and their funerary objects are being unearthed and it is disturbing those individuals on their journey through that western door. They've been digging up our burial sites for 500 years and probably take 500 years to undo all of that work. For us, that's only one part of what we do. The bigger job is taking care of those ancestors and those artifacts and watching over those. I see it more as caretaking. And so repatriation is just one portion of that work. Matthew Bustler and Dishnikas, Bodawadmi and Dao, 
Kegnik in the Bam Dagwas, Mshike and Dodem, Dwajak and Dochbia, Dwajak in the Da Odopi. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. My responsibilities are to preserve, protect, and maintain record of all archaeological cultural sites in our in Aboriginal homelands. Say I were to be informed by a private landowner that there had been erosion in, on their property and they're starting to see uh, ceramic pottery and then all of a sudden they you know, notice that there was some kind of a bone. Well, generally speaking, if you find human remains, uh, it's required that you contact the local authority. You have to call the police. The police come and investigate, and then they contact the tribes when they're like, hey, this is actually Native American. I've had it happen once. We went out there, we brought the GPS unit, and we plotted in where they found the remains. Recording the location of where our ancestors were and always had been. And now it's for certain protected. Yeah, it's really unusual work. This is really unusual work. Eva Winnetjohi, Takamoko Pai. My name is Eva. Um, I am from Mesa Grande. I am indigenous to this part of town, San Diego. And I work here at the San Diego Museum of Man. The history of this institution, it's an anthropological museum. The more ancestors they could get in here, the better. You know, anthropology is the study of humans, right? But yet they dehumanize human remains. This museum has hidden ancestors from communities, blatantly lying to them, saying we don't have them. So the history, between this museum and indigenous communities has not been a great one at all. So um, they are transitioning right now, um, starting great work and changing policies to protect the ancestors. And basically, I am the person that facilitates the ancestors going home. Repatriation, it's actually a really long process. It doesn't take overnight. Indigenous communities will contact us or we contact them. Once that happens, consultation begins. We kind of give them an inventory of what we think might be theirs, give them a chance to look it over and have that time to decide what belongs to them. Then it's a process of paperwork. We have a 30-day waiting period for any other Indigenous communities to give input or contest. After that 30-day waiting period, that's when the magic happens. <laughs> um, that's when it gets very exciting. Um, that, that means that repatriation will happen soon. My office becomes more and more empty. I see boxes leaving. That's the rewarding part. The thought of knowing that that ancestor is back home, back in the hands of a caring, loving community. That's my favorite part of the repatriation process. People, when you tell them about repatriation, they don't seem to get it. You literally have to hold human remains in your hands and wrap them and care for them and love them as you would love your brother, or your cousin, your mom, your dad. What does it mean to bring them, our ancestors back home to our communities? It's a relief, it's joy, it's happiness. It's a relief that they know that they're being cared for, <laughs> that they're coming back home. And I'm starting to break up because <laughs> that's just how wonderful it is. You just wondered what went on in their lives, you know, who their families were, who their clans were. You know, where did they, they have their summer 
lodges and where did they have their winter lodges and and you know were you a great hunter were you a great bead worker the more i do this work the more they're there and the more i feel it they're there all the time and it's uh it's really overwhelming and even though they they're not in this physical world they still have that pain and they still need that healing. They need us to help them heal. And when you do do a reburial, you can feel their peace coming through. You learn that connection through doing this work. The goal is to get them home, to give them that lovingly and kind and beautiful reburial ceremony and to, to let them know that, you know, they'll, they'll be safe in perpetuity from here on out. They're not going to be disturbed again. When you finally get through the whole process, and that last shovel full of dirt has been laid on top of the grave. That, that feeling of completion, that feeling that they're back to where they were supposed to be is an undescribable feeling. It's an overwhelming emotion. We try our best to like decolonize that environment. We try to speak our language and we sing those songs. We honor our ancestors in the best way we can. It's the happiest feeling in the world. I mean, it's everything because there's not a lot of people who are willing to, to touch human remains. To, to wrap them in a loving way and speak only goodness into them and let them know that you know who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, that they'll be safe with you, that, that you're just gonna try your hardest to do it in the best way that you know how because maybe you don't know all the words in the language or maybe you don't know all the songs or maybe you don't know the full, the full ceremony or, or, or maybe you're just starting out, whatever it is. But you, you put that love and only kindness into the ancestors because we love them so much. And when the day comes that you can bring them home, I don't know that I have a word to describe that level of happiness. The only thing I can equate it to is the day that I watched my niece be born into this world. It was like the same level of happiness. We understand that we were chosen to do this work and oftentimes the ancestors will work through us. And so there might not be a physical body attached to those remains. There might not be a heart beating. There might not be a person there. But the ancestors want to go home. So we have to have people in this physical world who will open their hearts and their minds to allow the ancestors to speak through them, giving them a voice in this physical world that they don't have anymore. It's not easy when you lose your loved ones. You know, they're gone to the spirit world and will be there eventually, but as we're left behind, sometimes it's very hard. Some of us were taught that heaven is way up in the sky above the clouds. And the elders that shared teachings with me, they said it's not way up there above the clouds. The spirit world is all around us. So your loved ones, we can't see them, we can't hear them, but they're all around us. Sometimes we get visits in our dreams. So we like to remember them. We like to do things that we did together with them, dance and sing. And the reason that we care so much, the reason we fight so hard, is because we know every time we bring an ancestor home, it helps to heal our communities. If we heal our communities, we heal our circle, we heal our families, we heal our people. This is who we are and this is our responsibility.
And I'm just thankful that the ancestors trust me to do this work for them. I don't see a greater honor than that. All right, so we know we have all of our relations over there in the spirit world. Let's make some noise. Let them know we're still here. Anishinaabe proud. Hey. Uh, I think we're running a little over time. So in terms of what we wanted to present. Um, maybe this is, uh, well, sorry, do you want to say something first, Zach? No, no, I was saying it could be a good time to, yeah, just maybe talk a little bit what we just saw and, and recap and maybe open it up to the audience for some questions. Yeah, I was just going to make a shameless plug that uh, stuff about culture capture, additive defacement, and savage philosophy, if people are free tomorrow night at Pacific Film Archive, uh, there'll be more work kind of unpacking those more esoteric ideas and concerns, kind of like the flip side of, of what we just presented on. Um, but yeah, maybe we can talk about what we just saw. Actually, I might bring something up from the violence of a civilization without secrets that I thought was interesting, especially in terms of this connection with technology. We quote extensively from this Baudrillard essay, uh, Ramsey and the Rosy Colored Resurrection. And I kind of love that piece because it's hilarious and super matter of fact in this way, where he's kind of talking about, um, what's also relevant for Zach and I, because we're both, both Egyptian as well. We call ourselves Egyptian, Ojibwe Egyptians. So also the collection of human remains is something that uh, affects both of our cultural heritage on both sides of our families. Um, but Baudrillard kind of makes this point, which is the fact that ancient Egyptians had technology to preserve human remains for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And the second that they were unearthed or discovered or removed from the context and the technology that kept them whole, they now need constant maintenance and care to preserve them. And this weird kind of conceptual loop-de-loop -loop that they were, that the technology was in place to preserve them forever already. And that this, this idea that you would remove something to save it for posterity for the future is actually kind of, is almost like death drive for destroying it. Uh, and some could argue like, you know, Derrida's archive fever, this idea that like to create an archive is also to move towards death and destruction. Uh, you're trying to save something, which means you'll also acknowledge that it'll die and disappear. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think that's a tangent at all. I think that connection is super important. Um, and it's really the undercurrent, I think, of a lot of the, that work um, and speaks to Anakobujigan as well. Um, just the, that idea that sometimes that preservation um, is equals death, actually. Um, I think there's a, there's a big thinking, especially like in the indigenous library sciences or information sciences perspective, that uh, not just ancestors, but you know, objects of cultural importance. Um, they have uh, meaning and life and, and relevance and it's so much that's given to them through their connection uh, with people um, and the way that people use them and create them and share them and discard them. And then when you separate uh, an object um, that might be considered animate uh, from the people who consider it animate, you, you effectively you, you kill it in a sense. Um, so it's not just true for, for the mummy quite, quite literally um, in terms of like, removing the mummy to make it visible, sort of destroying this perfect funerary technology. Um, but it, it's true in, in so many different ways uh, when it comes to, to repatriation. And I think also just like the field of, of ethnology in, in general um, for ethnography or ethnology to like live like the object sort of has to, has to die in a sense. Um, and there's an important dichotomy uh, between sort of preservation and perpetuation. Um, like what it takes to you know preserve something and sealed off forever uh, versus what it means to sort of actually perpetuate and move forward uh, a practice or an idea or a, a force as opposed to just uh, preserving a physical material. Maybe also an extension of that idea that relates to the clip we just saw is also thinking about the Zeebling Center, which is uh, the Saginaw Chippewa Tribes Tribal Museum, and also this emergence of tribal museums and tribal historical societies that are kind of uh, telling their history from their own embodied perspective. And there's something that really is kind of interesting that happens across the board in those contexts where 
there's an emphasis on yeah perpetuating culture and like a museum or history being in service of perpetuating that culture rather than preserving the past it's by enacting the past and the present is like how that 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 cycle continues uh so there's like usually very few collections in most traveled museums i mean obviously again that's like the, the the split between information and knowledge like there is a necessity to to share this information so that way there is like legibility and understanding from non-native audiences or settler audiences uh, in terms of understanding what what the history is from our perspective but at the same time yeah it's more about enacting than showing certainly and do you want to keep going or ask? no let, let her in i just one other thing too just to get back to sort of that that sample uh, from my publish again and, and thinking again was that adam opened with um with Yip Tuck and K. Wen Yang's essay, Decolonization, it's not a metaphor. Um, the sort of idea that the actual non-metaphorical decolonization is the repatriation or rematriation of all indigenous land and life, um, and how that does tie in sort of this idea of, of savage philosophy or magical thinking, that, that representation makes reality, that discourse deploys forces. I think in particular, it's interesting um, to think about the work of these repatriation specialists, um, where Maybe in the 1960s or 70s, if you you told somebody that um, you know half of half of all the Michigan tribes' ancestors uh, that are based in the U.S. would have been repatriated um, by now, I think a lot of people would have thought about that that was impossible because uh, there was there was no way to make that happen legally, practically speaking. Um, but it took a, a lot of people sort of making it possible and believing it's possible. Maria Pearson in Iowa and so many activists throughout Indian country, throughout the country, um, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, passing these federal laws um, to make uh, repatriation or repatriation of our ancestors possible. Um, I think when it comes to decolonization, it's not a metaphor in these real sort of material concerns um, when it comes to land and, and our ancestors being returned. I think that also that that sort of thinking is, is necessary when it comes to repatriate land back or the repatriation of, of land as well. That you know land was sort of taken parcel by parcel from indigenous people over a period of 500 years because settlers thought it was possible and believed in the sort of destiny. Um, and that if indigenous people sort of want to get the land back, it, it also is a matter of sort of savage philosophy to a certain extent, or, or creating the conditions for possibility amongst non-indigenous people. To not think that that's an absurd idea, but so that actually could have. One of also the practical concerns for both of those kind of interests of Till and Collide is also this thought about because NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Protection Repatriation Act, whoops, uh, uh, it also protects burial sites. So also there is a radical potential for land back within the context of repatriation, rematriation, and respect for ancestors. Uh, in the sense that, like, if we acknowledge all of the United States and Canada is a Indian burial ground, then also there's potential to stop kind of resource extraction, other kinds of infrastructure that would kind of decimate and desecrate uh, our tribes' burial grounds and ancestors' resting places. And that's also something we're kind of interested in unpacking is how those two things actually collide or dovetail into each other. Yeah, and I think just to maybe end it and then we can open up to questions um, and sort of pivot to what, to what, what uh, we'll be showing tomorrow too, is, is thinking about uh, culture capture, which I just tease a little bit um, of this idea of uh, sort of virtual or, or a spectral repatriation, but sort of intervention to museum archives or settler colonial monuments, um, thinking about the ways that uh, through, through digital technology, photogrammetry and um, 3D modeling, but there, there can be ways of uh, virtually or especially sort of repatriating objects um, or sort of re reconfiguring uh, monuments um, in ways that sort of dovetail this idea of savage philosophy and the ways in which our sort of representations influence reality. And yeah, sorry we ran out of time, but shameless plug, tomorrow we'll be going deep dive into culture capture and savage philosophy and uh, all the other great opportunities that New Red Order can have you be a part of. Also, as a public secret society, everyone's welcome to join. There's a hotline, 1-888-NEW-RED-1. That's 1-888-NEW-RED-1. 
or you can go to newredorder.org to sign up or come to the screening tomorrow. It's going to get wacky. Uh, maybe it's a good time for a few questions. But yeah, we can also... I, can, I can pop in and help with that. Yeah, first off, um, just like want to give you like a huge virtual round of applause for everything you showed and just like so much appreciation. Um, for the work you're doing. And I can like definitely see how making that film that you just showed has been like a five years in the making. Um, yeah, I feel like having it, you know, that's like a, a totally different time scale from like film production. It's like completely outside of it and outside of like, yeah, like time. I feel like um, seeing how much uh, the folks in the film were talking about like the joy and how it's like one person said it was like basically like seeing her niece being born yeah. um also just like makes me think that it's really this like untapped source of like joy like i feel like on the left there's talk about like joyful mil militancy and often that means something like being in the street or something or having some sort of like in the trenches political victory and this just felt like a whole other sort of like landscape of like emotion and, and thinking. And um, I'm wondering like, you know, you were talking about like the challenges of making a film when you can't film the subjects and you wouldn't want to. And, you know, watching that film, it didn't feel like anything was missing or there was like a lack of things to look at. And I'm wondering just how making this film has just like changed you as a filmmaker and both of you as filmmakers, like has it changed your approach to film? Yeah, I mean, I think, a really big thing that I, there's this amazing Maori filmmaker, Barry Barclay, uh, and he writes really eloquently about the temp temporality of making indigenous cinema and like the need to take time <laughs> and the need to build trust and the need to keep showing up uh, because there is such a legacy of extraction. But also I feel like anytime people are working with ancestors in this way, there's like this kind of, not to get too woo-woo, but almost like spiritualist vetting that happens, where it's like you have to be kind of called to do it. And that's something that comes across in all the people who are doing that work that we've talked to. And I think that's been the most kind of like humbling and freaky thing is realizing that we're also being called or asked to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not something I would say lightly a couple of years ago, as we were still kind of in the thick of it, but also feel like we're things have opened up in a way where I feel like it's it's the right thing to do. And also like, like in terms of all this work, like there's this issue with like secrecy and secrecy is like a, a powerful tool to protect something uh, in terms of like, again, like the common good or the outside interest. Um, so it is this really, this tightrope walk trying to do this project specifically. And I think it's been the hardest project we've worked on in terms of like, I mean, kind of anecdotally, like there's a reburial ceremony in, in the footage that we just saw. And like for the first two years, people were like, you're never gonna show that. We don't want that filmed. And we're like, of course, like we, we won't even, work, you know, don't worry about it. And then like after a couple of years, they're like, oh, you're leaving next week. Like, why don't you stay around a little longer? We're doing a reburial ceremony. You should come and film it. And we're like, whoa, okay. Like <laughs> this is a whole different ball game now. And it's kind of like trusting that process and trusting the people we're working with and trusting uh, place that we're coming from in, in terms of yeah it's kind of a crapshoot in terms of just being like putting out the best intentions and kind of and then that happens with any documentary you know what I mean you never know really how it's going to all fit together <laughs> but I feel like in this process it's even more exaggerated in terms of the precarity or like the difficulty of planning or pinning down exactly what what will be on screen or how the story will be told and what is that like going from like Michigan where you grew up and obviously like, you know, a lot from your mom's work and then like going to San Diego, like what is it like to move between different communities? I think this is thing that's been really inspiring is that there's so many similarities in terms of the people. And I think that goes back to this thing about everyone kind of having this calling to do this work. And that's like been the most humbling thing is that even across Native communities. And I guess something I should preface this with, but you know, there's like 550 different tribes in North America and some tribes and communities like 
aren't concerned with ancestors or human remains. Like it's not part of their cosmology or belief system. You know what I mean? Um, so it's also interesting. I just don't want to like clob everything together and just wanted to. Is that, do you want to say something? Sorry, I'm rambling now. No, no, that's really great. Um, yeah, I think it's it's been a really amazing opportunity to uh, sort of connect with, with different indigenous groups across North America to see how they're dealing with repatriation. And also, yeah, just to see how much they're working together too. Um, everyone has unique histories of colonization, similar uh, similar themes and similar stories. And I think MACPRA itself is an example of like how much is to be gained um, through tribes working together. And, you know, without sort of flattening our, our respective interests or cultures, the sort of pan indigenous push does have like a real, a lot of momentum and a lot of political pressures is able to be sort of applied through that. Um, yeah, it's just really amazing to, to see those connections be made. Um, and yeah, one of the amazing things with that project too is just seeing how much, seeing the state and the federal government sort of have to bow down to the tribes um, just from a, a practical legal standpoint. It's also uh, just really heartening to see on some level. It's also been something that's difficult about making this film is because now some of the places, some of the institutions that housed human remains or ancestors now they're so woke that they won't let us film in certain places <laughs> without doing proper protocol which is you know great in right. terms of like the work we're all trying to do but like from our perspective it's also like oh <laughs> yeah it has been shocking over that long period of relatively long period of time for film's production four or five years um to see that real sea change in sort of opinion uh and and policies at a lot of institutions. Um, they're just really we're capturing a, a moment where a lot is shifting. And there's a lot more work to be done too, of course. Yeah, and that's definitely true at, at UC Berkeley too. I, I think I've like emailed with both of you a little bit about this, but like the Hearst Museum has like really like made this a big priority in the past few years in a way that it certainly was not before then. And um, there is even, um, there's two Ohlone chefs who started Cafe Ohlone who are opening a cafe in the courtyard of the Hearst Museum. And that's opening like at the end of the semester. Um, and they like acknowledge that it is in some ways a very strange location for them, but it's also like, it is a, a sea change in everyone's relationship to the museum and um, hopefully like making better relations. What they just wanted that's pretty i gotta come back at the end of the semester yeah yeah <laughs> you're here april 23rd i think that's when they're doing like a preview and i can also like i think laura can put that link in the chat i'm gonna doing like a tasting and like come check out the space i'll come back next time yeah <laughs> what is what because we were talking about san diego and michigan but i think uh, an aim for the film altogether, like once we get over the hump or keep keep working on it is also to like zoom out even further to like an international scale and scope, especially considering that NAGPRA is a federal law that doesn't affect any other institutions outside of America. Mm -hmm. So like there's huge collections of ancestors all over Europe. Uh, and then also thinking about discourses around like the British Museum and art from Africa and other places in the world. And that, that I think ideally that it becomes more of like a philosophical debate or understanding around these things on a global scale as a, but because there is such a unique and idiosyncratic relation between fed, the federal government and native tribes and that's kind of like our embodied position as people where we're from that that's what we're focusing with but it spirals out in many directions the more you step back from yeah and for the repatriation specialists doing the work they sort of have this priority of, of you know ancestors in the US because there is that, that foundational law that, that makes repatriation possible and easy. But Adam is Adam saying, when it comes to internationally, you're really just depending on, on the goodwill of an institution. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these institutions um, really view repatriation or repatriation as a sort of existential threat on some level. Um, like if if we're giving one thing back, then, then where does the line get drawn is, is often the argument um, that's sort of made and that people are are concerned about losing their museums and their livelihood to a certain extent. Um, but I think that's also a, an overblown concern. And it's really about uh, a big sort of cultural and ethical shift that needs to happen at these institutions. And uh, not that 
they can't exist, but that they have to exist in, in a different way. Um, and it's been yeah, heartening to see that process start to happen, but it is really, does seem to be a, a, a generational thing that happens at a, a kind of the glacial pace that, that sort of institutional inertia often creates. And you two were just um, in, was it Copenhagen when you had your last show? That yeah. was like bringing together indigenous people from like all around the world. Yeah, shameless plug. We just opened the show at Kunsthal Charlottenburg. It's like the MoMA PS1 of Denmark. If folks are in the area, it's up until August 7th. Uh, that was really exciting because Denmark has colonized Kalalut Nuna or Greenland for 300 years now. And the conversation in Denmark around that is so repressed and so silenced that I felt like I was like in a time machine or something in terms of like the debates and dialogues that were happening. Uh, and it was really meaningful to kind of like explode that conversation in that context by including a lot of Inuit artists from Kalalut Nuna, but also as far away as Hawaii and all over, all over Indian country in the States and everywhere else. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of a scope or perspective our work is trying to go in is think, what, what is internationalism in the context of indigeneity? Uh, especially because to be indigenous constantly implies some kind of prior and some kind of local or some kind of connection to place but that can also be a very limiting thing um, and kind of wanting to kind of shake that up and also maybe a kind of a move back to kind of more activism and networking and intersectional activism that was happening in the 70s uh, in terms of realizing the similarities of each of our specificities but also realizing the nuance and I guess reading a lot of like the colonial theory coming from Kalalut Nunat it was really inspiring to see how similar it was, but what was more inspiring was to see how different it was. And the way I kind of described it, it was that it was like 15 degrees different. And like that, that those 15 degrees felt like very fertile territory to start formulating new kinds of decolonial strategies or kind of configurations. And maybe just to spiral on that real quick, something I think we're trying to work towards and formulate now is developing language and ideas that drop the D and re, because so often like, all of our political concerns, all of our creative practices are concerned with undoing something. And I think we're trying to get to a place in terms of imagining indigenous futures where we can say what we're for and not what we're against. And we don't have the answers for that yet, but I think that's what we're hoping to start to try to crack next. I think, and I think it's really exciting to do that sort of in dialogue with indigenous people from, from around the globe, just like, the ways that even different tribes in Michigan are able to sort of help each other out and different tribes nationally. I feel like that is a great place for us to stop and also like a great segue to the film screening tomorrow that everyone should go to. Yeah. Um, okay, on behalf of BCNM, thank you so, so, so much. I feel like this is just such important work for everyone in our community. And um, I'm excited to keep following the progress in this film and definitely come back in person. <laughs> That's a good plan. Thanks right. for having us. Good yeah, night, everyone. Bye. Bye.